started. You were logged into the third in a series in the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association's um, 2015 uh, webinar series. And uh, um, it's entitled Emerging Issues in the Field of Mental Health Counseling. Today, we're going to be covering DSM-5. We're going to cover ICD-10 and uh, insurance companies, third-party payers, um, and try to bring all this together. There have been a lot of questions in the DSM-5 trainings that I've been a part of um, that deal with, look, you know, when is it that we're supposed to use DSM-5 and how do we make this work when it comes to insurance and documentation and so forth? So my hope is that we're going to get all those things answered for you today. And I want to start off today by launching a poll here. Um, I'm going to start off by figuring out who we have present in the room today. So you're going to see on your screen in a moment um, a polling question. Which of the following professional designations do you most relate to or, or best describes you? And your options are um, number one, uh, LMHC, LMFT, or LCSW, so your master's level licensed clinician. Your second option is that you're a registered intern, whether that be for mental health counseling, marriage and family therapy, or clinical social work. Third option is are you a student? Maybe you're a counseling student. And then um, the next option is a psychologist, and then other. I'll give you just a moment. It looks like almost, um, looks like about 83% of you, or actually about 90% of you, have already participated. I'll give you just a moment longer to click on the option that best describes you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And I'm going to show you what our results are here. Looks like the results are um, that 78% of you are master's level licensed um, clinicians, 17% are registered interns, and then 4% of you are other be interesting to see um, what other is in this case. All right, so getting back, oh, we are in the wrong place on the presentation. Let me get us back to where we're supposed to be. Okay, there we are, perfect. Okay, so the way that this webinar is going to work is that I'm gonna start off by um, by kind of reviewing with you what the paradigm shift is with DSM-5. What are they trying to accomplish in the DSM-5? And then once you get the paradigm shift down, all of these, a lot of these questions that deal with documentation and, and getting paid through insurance companies and third-party payers, they all start to come together and make sense a little bit more if you can understand the paradigm shift. So about half of this webinar is gonna be what really what were they trying to accomplish with the newest edition? And then the second half is going to be um, more, some frequently asked questions that people have um, that deal with insurance and DSM-5, other third party payers and documentation and so forth. So I wanna get a sense also of um, what your experience has been with DSM-5 so far. So there's another polling question that we're gonna be launching right now. Um, polling question is, how would you classify your knowledge of DSM-5? Your options are, um, I'm president of the DSM-5 fan club, which basically means um, you know your stuff. And the second option is better than average. You think you have a pretty good handle of DSM-5 and, and what's changed. Third option is, ah, so-so. We've got about an average understanding of DSM-5. And then your last option is DSM what, which would be the right option to select if you have virtually no or very little exposure to DSM-5 so far. Looks like so far about 67% of you have launched a vote for this one. I'll give you just a moment longer. And we are at about 88% now. I'm going to go ahead, oh, 96%. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll then and show you what our results are. Looks like 25% of you are saying better than average, 67% of you are saying so-so, and then 8% of you have virtually no exposure to DSM-5 whatsoever. Okay, that's good to know. So um, let's get right back on to the slideshow here. 
So the first thing that they wanted to accomplish with the DSM-5 is they wanted to move towards more of a multi-dimensional diagnostic process, um, a way of um, thinking of disorders not so much as necessarily clear-cut, very dichotomous categories, um, but sometimes as um, a category where there can be a variety of manifestations and a tremendous range in terms of severity and so forth. So um, some of the ways that they tried to accomplish this in DSM-5 would be to take any disorder, any disorders that appear to be very similar, um, they merged those disorders together and then created spectrums. So in a sense, you'll actually see fewer diagnoses available with the DSM-5, a reduction in the number of separate diagnoses. But what you'll see is that with the remaining diagnoses, there are all these extra options um, to, to place a disorder on a spectrum in terms of things like severity or level of support. So a couple examples of this. Um, what used to be a major dep depressive disorder chronic would be somebody who um, is experiencing a major depressive episode that's lasted for two years or longer. But then look at dysthymia. Dysthymia is that milder depression. It's not a major depressive episode, but it is clinically significant but it's very long lasting, again, two years or longer, like that little gray cloud that's constantly following somebody around. Well, the biggest difference between major depressive disorder chronic and dysthymia was basically severity. Major depressive disorder chronic was more severe than dysthymia. So they took those two disorders, merged them together into one diagnosis, persistent depressive disorder, and then gave you an option in terms of severity and several other specifiers. So you'll see a lot of grouping disorders together that are similar, but then creating spectrums within the disorder itself. Because as we all know, you could have two different people with the same diagnosis um, that can be functioning in very different ways. So um, another thing that they tried to do was some other disorders that were already in the DSM-5. Um, they tried to create new spectrums so ADHD is an example. You can now tack on to the end of an ADHD diagnosis um, a specifier for how severe the symptom presentation is. And the DSM-5 gives you a pretty good sort of layout in terms of um, determining what those uh, that level of severity is. Going back to this first bullet point, substance use disorders, what was the biggest difference in DSM-4 between substance abuse and substance dependence? Well, the biggest difference was really severity. Substance abuse was a, uh, was a, le a milder manifestation of the disorder compared to substance dependence. So again, you'll see they merge those two together um, with one substance use disorder that we'll see ranging from mild to severe. And then um, one thing that we expected to see with the DSM-5 was an entirely new system for diagnosing personality disorders. It was called a hybrid multidimensional model, and it was a much less dichotomous form uh, or model for diagnosing personality disorders based on the finding that oftentimes it's almost the, the rule rather than the exception of the rule that people will meet the diagnostic criteria for more than one personality disorder concurrent. Or if they don't fully meet the diagnostic criteria for two or more personality disorders, maybe they fully meet the diagnostic criteria for one personality disorder, but they got features of some other personality clusters. This new model would have created more of a smorgasbord sort of way of um, labeling personality disorders. Unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately, depending on who you ask, they didn't implement this in DSM-5. We were kind of surprised because they planned on implementing it, and then there was about a six-month blackout period before the actual release of the DSM-5, and during that blackout period, they decided not to implement the new system. Instead, um, what they decided to do was to create an appendix, um, or, or not to create an appendix, but to place the new system in the appendix, or actually, I'm sorry, not in the appendix, but in section three of the DSM-5, for disorders um, to be considered for adoption in future um, 
in, a, in future DSM versions. So the writing on the wall is that we will see this new personality disorder system being implemented, but they decided it was premature to do with DSM-5 in part because of feedback that they got from clinicians. Um, a lot of times we just don't like change and, and we've got to be eased into major changes in a diagnostic system. And so they thought they'll introduce it in section three and then give us a little bit of time to to dialogue about it, learn more about it, and understand it before they actually implement it in a future DSM uh, form. So I'm going to take just a quick moment here um, to take a look at our chat box and make sure that nobody's experiencing any major problems. It doesn't look like anybody is. Um, so I'm going to continue on to our next slide here. The next thing that they try to do with DSM-5 is they really wanted to um, to eliminate the age-old concept of mind-body dualism. Mind-body dualism is basically the idea that we've got brains and we've got bodies and they're sort of separate things. Well, the American Psychiatric Association, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that um, our brains are in fact parts of our part of our bodies and that therefore disorders of the mind are also disorders of the body and they really can't be separated. As we all know, with a lot of these mental processes, um, we experience very physical manifestations of mental disorders. The overlap between uh, mind and body is so substantial that anymore it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try and separate mental disorders from other disorders of the body. So some ways that you'll see this play out in the DSM-5 is that you, the old term general medical condition, for example, say a depressive disorder due to a general medical condition, has been replaced with the term another medical condition. Why did they do that? Well, they did it because um, the mental disorder, um, the depression, is a medical condition, just like um, any other medical condition is. You'll also see that they eliminate, eliminated the multi-axial system, so axis 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 no longer exist in the DSM. Um, they did that because a lot of people um, started to conceptualize that basically anything on axis 1 is the real disorder, so to speak, that we're treating. Nothing else is, um, is really real. We'd, we'd sort of focus more on what we see on axis 1 as though the other axes don't really matter too much. Uh, and again, on the old multi-axial diagnostic system, you're separating medical conditions from mental conditions as though mental conditions are not medical conditions. And so again, um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we're trying to eliminate the mind-body dualism. So that's part of the justification for the multi-axial system going away, which is kind of a big deal to people who are used to diagnosing with the multi-axial system. Now, what does it look like when you make a DSM-5 diagnosis now that you don't have those axes anymore? I'm going to show you that later on, so we'll get to it. You'll also see when it comes to substance use disorders, let's say you had somebody with a cannabis dependence diagnosis in DSM-4. Well, you would have the option, not just the option, but you would be expected to tack on a specifier to the end of that diagnosis in the DSM-4. You would either say cannabis dependence, comma, with physiological dependence, or you would say cannabis dependence, comma, without physiological dependence. And physiological dependence basically meant, look, do they have tolerance or withdrawal? And if they don't have tolerance or withdrawal, then they don't have physiological dependence. Well, that doesn't, again, make a whole lot of sense because um, that sort of denotes that we can separate psychological addiction from a physical addiction. Um, when actually a psychological addiction is very much organic in nature and it involves physiology. So you really can't separate the two anymore. So they got rid of those specifiers at the end of a dependence diagnosis. And another example of this, you'll see that the somatic symptom disorder and pain disorder diagnoses de-emphasize delineating between is there an organic cause for these um, physical sensations or is there not an organic cause? This is very hard to, again, disorders of the mind are organic in nature. So it's, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to delineate between the two in that, in that sense. All right, so from time to time, I'm going to just sort of um, 
monitor through here to the uh, um, the chat box, and I can see looks like everything so far is great. Um, welcome, uh, Darlene's class. Looks like uh, Darlene Silvernail, um, Dr. Silvernail is, log Silvernail is logged in with eight of her students, and uh, somebody's hungry. It looks like. <laughs> Okay, so getting back to the slides here. The next thing that they tried to do, let me close out of the chat box, in the DSM-5 was to enhance understanding of the cultural and developmental influences in the diagnostic process. Oops, I'm a couple slides behind. Let me get back to the right slide here. So some of the ways, well, no, I'm sorry, I skipped something. The next item is that they wanted to reduce the not otherwise specified category so that we could get more specific. I don't know about you guys, but I would see, like I used to work for vocational rehabilitation. I worked there for about seven years. And we would always, as part of the eligibility process and determining whether or not somebody was eligible for rehabilitation services for a mental disorder, we would send them off to have an in-depth personality or psychological evaluation, particularly if we didn't have recent records um, documenting their, the nature of their mental disorders. And all the time I would get these psychological evaluation reports, which were very thorough. But when you skip to the diagnostic part, there would be all these NOS diagnoses, cognitive disorder, NOS, depressive disorder, NOS, anxiety disorder, NOS, personality disorder, NOS. And when you would see this NOS, a lot of times, frankly speaking, you could translate the NOS diagnosis into this clinician either did not have sufficient time to really get down to a more specific diagnosis, or they just don't want to go through the effort of doing it. Um, more rarely was the NOS category being used accurately, which is the, an actual case where we have collected, we've done our due diligence, we've done a thorough diagnosis, um, a diagnostic process, and it is clear to us that the person does not neatly fit into this a specific disorder category because of maybe one or two variables. And so we're gonna say not otherwise specified because it's still, a, there's still clinically significant impairment or distress. They still require um, some kind of treatment intervention and could benefit from a treatment intervention. Rarely did people use the NOS category accurately. They usually use it because they don't have time or because frankly speaking, maybe they're lazy. So in the DSM-5, they wanted to reduce um, the frequency of, of the NOS diagnosis. So what they did was they scratched it. There no longer is an NOS um, uh, option in the DSM-5. You now have two replacement options. Option number one, you can say other specified. This is the option they would prefer for you to use. If you say other specified, then you must, in your diagnosis, specifically denote why it is that the person doesn't neatly fit into that diagnostic category. So an example is, you could diagnose somebody with depressive disorder, comma, other specified, comma, does not meet duration criterion. This could be used in a scenario where let's say that a person has met all, um, has met the symptoms for a major depressive episode for one week and six days. Well, as you may know, you can't call it a major depressive episode unless the symptoms have been persistent for a minimum of two weeks. So what happens if somebody's just shy of the two weeks? Do you expect that the depressive symptoms are going to magically disappear tomorrow? Or do you diagnose them depressive disorder, comma, other specified, comma, does not meet duration criterion? The point is, though, that any other clinician will be able to look at your diagnosis and they know exactly why it is that this person doesn't neatly fit into that diagnostic um, category. Whereas with the old system, we have no clue what the NOS means when we see it. Well, guess what though? They gave you yet another option. You can instead tack on unspecified at the end. You could say depressive disorder, comma, unspecified. Guess what that means? That's basically NOS. Um, unspecified means you're not telling anybody why it is that the person doesn't neatly fit into that diagnosis. And they discourage the use of this tack on or this specifier unspecified. Um, they would prefer that you not use that. They'd rather use other specified and then indicate why it is that you're not, um, that the person doesn't neatly fit into the disorder. So the pessimists are saying, look, everyone's just going to use unspecified now. 
And the optimists are saying, no, maybe people will really pay attention and they'll start doing the other specified thing, and then they'll be writing in their diagnosis exactly why the person doesn't neatly fit into the category, um, which would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? Okay, so um, another example of reducing the NOS category is you'll see a couple new disorders in the DSM-5. You're going to see binge eating disorder, um, and the binge eating disorder, uh, you can... Basically, this would apply, in the past, we used to have a lot of eating disorder NOSs. And um, we would use a scenario like, say, somebody has um, binge eating episodes, and those binge eating episodes are pretty severe, and they're causing this person clinically significant impairment or distress, and this person really needs help. But guess what they don't have? They don't have the compensatory behaviors that are required for a diagnosis of bulimia. So they're not, for example, purging or exercising excessively or those sorts of things. Um, they just have the binge eating component. There was no diagnosis for that previously. So we had a ton of eating disorder NOS diagnoses. This new binge eating disorder will probably dramatically reduce the prevalence of that eating disorder NOS diagnosis. Same thing with mild neurocognitive disorder. Um, it's a scenario where somebody doesn't quite meet the threshold for dementia, but nonetheless they have substantial cognitive deficits that are causing them significant problems, and they'd probably respond well to treatment. And they also added all kinds of specific sleep disorders. They're not new disorders. They're the same disorders that neurologists and medical sleep specialists have been using for a long time. It's just that the DSM used to not list those diagnoses. Um, and so we'd see a lot of sleep disorder NOS, sleep disorder NOS, sleep disorder NOS, but now you have other options like REM sleep behavior disorder and so forth. So you can get very specific about what the sleep disorder is. And in the DSM-4, you could only diagnose agoraphobia if the person had panic disorder. You would say panic disorder with agoraphobia or panic disorder without agoraphobia. But come to find out, there are a lot of people who are agoraphobic but don't have a panic disorder. So there used to be no diagnosis for them. Well, now there is. So those are some of their efforts to try and reduce that NOS category. All right, now before I move on, I'm gonna take a quick look here um, to make sure there aren't, nope, nothing new in terms of comments, perfect. Okay, so now what about the cultural and developmental influences? They really wanted to expand our consideration of these influences in the diagnostic process. So how did they pull that off in the DSM-5? Well, there are a few things they did. They revised the definition of mental disorder in the DSM-5, and you'll see that in that definition, they very much are trying to bring in an emphasis on cultural and developmental influences. They added all kinds of interesting um, cultural uh, manifestations of disorders. For example, they added a possession form manifestation to dissociative disorders for cultures um, where there's more widespread be spread beliefs of um, possession, that some spiritual entity has possessed somebody and so forth. They've created a new tool that I like. I think it's a great tool. It's called the cultural formulation interview. It's basically this questionnaire that helps you to tap into how somebody's culture and their developmental experiences um, influence um, the disorder that they're presenting with. So it has questions like, you know, what do your friends, family members, and neighbors say about this problem? What does your priest or rabbi or imam or, you know, whoever say about this problem? And that gives you a sense of um, the cultural lens of the individual in front of you and how that connects to the symptoms that they're um, expressing or describing. That tool is available for free at dsm5.org, and I'm going to show you that resource at the end of the webinar today. Now, we're going to be moving at a pretty fast pace through some of these things, but I am going to give you some options for asking some questions um, later on. Hopefully, we'll have time for a good FAQ session, but you'll probably see a lot of the questions you're coming up with are going to be answered um, in some of the upcoming slides, so I'm kind of holding off on that for now. You'll also see that they reordered the actual chapters, the, the categories of disorders based on developmental lifespan. 
Um, for example, you'll see that neurodevelopmental disorders chapter appears early on in the DSM-5, whereas personality disorders appears later on in the order of chapters because the age at which somebody um, meets the diagnostic criteria for these disorders or the age of onset of these disorders varies. So they tried to honor the developmental lifespan by actually reordering the chapters in the DSM-5. They, um, under substance abuse, well, actually, now it's substance use disorder. You'll you'll see that the old DSM-4 criterion of recurrent use despite um, uh, recurrent legal problems, they got rid of that criterion. Now, you might ask, well, well, what does that have to do with cultural sensitivity? And the answer is that um, is kind of twofold. Number one, different cultures will um, illegalize different things when it comes to substance use. So, for example, here in the U.S., I mean, you even possess um, cocaine, and that's um, charge-worthy. Marijuana varies from state to state and um, all kinds of other factors. Um, alcohol, usually legal to possess it if you're 21 years of age or older in certain circumstances and scenarios. So does it make sense to tie a mental disorder to a political or social or societal rule that is that varies from culture to culture. But the second component is that if I were a black male, let's say, and let's say that I had in my pocket um, a dime bag of marijuana and I was walking down a sidewalk um, near a school, I'm statistically going to be more likely to be stopped and charged for having that marijuana than if I were a white male walking down the same sidewalk. So again, do we really want to tie a criterion for mental disorder to variables that are heavily influenced um, uh, by um, uh, social or cultural um, uh, biases? Okay, so then we'll also see things like in the diagnostic criteria for ADHD, they give you specific examples of how the symptoms might look depending on where you are in the developmental lifespan. So you'll see, um, we'll look at, in children it might look like this, but in adults it might look like this instead. And there's a new diagnosis, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and that was because depression looks different with um, adolescents and children than it often does with adults. And so children who maybe have more of an irritability component of depression and an anhedonia were being misdiagnosed as bipolar when they really weren't bipolar. Um, and instead, they were really depressed. Um, and so they have a new disruptive mood dysregulation disorder that's for adolescents and children only that's lumped under the depressive disorders chapter now. So you can research that later if you want more information. We just don't have time in this presentation to go into specific criteria with these new disorders. And so there are some other examples on here that you can look at at your leisure if you want to. I will be showing you all how to access this um, presentation and many other resources at the end of our webinar. So no worries there. You'll get all of this. Okay. So another thing they wanted to do was they really wanted to um, focus on, highlight, and promote the idea of abnormal not being the same as disordered. You know, an, an interesting thing is one of the big um, criticisms for the DSM has been that we are, people are concerned that we are progressively um, pathologizing um, abnormal behaviors that aren't necessarily disordered. But actually, in the DSM-5, you'll see a lot of efforts to try and really separate the two. Um, you'll see that this is reflected in the new definition of mental disorder. And you will also see that um, uh, paraphilias, for example, has been reworded paraphilic disorders. Why? Because you could have a paraphilia, meaning an unusual or abnormal fetish, for example. But if it's not causing significant impairment or distress to you or other people, then is it really a disorder or not? I'm going to pause for just a quick second here because I'm getting a, um, a little warning that I should probably reduce my uh, windows that are open right now so we maintain high quality with the presentation. Give me just a quick moment. There we go. All right. So you'll also see that 
um, there's now an intellectual disorder which used to be mental retardation in the DSM-4. Um, and in the DSM-4, the diagnosis mental retardation, you had to explore two different components. Number one, the in person's intellectual capabilities, their IQ score. Number two, their adaptive functioning, how well they're actually adapting in the context of their social environment. And then you would define severity of mental retardation, which would range from mild to moderate to severe to profound, that would be based on the IQ score, the number on the IQ score. But there are a few problems with this. The first problem is, again, cultural sensitivity. There's a lot of criticism for our IQ tests that they are culturally biased, and therefore the number that people get may not be an accurate depiction of their intelligence. And then the second, um, the second reason, though, is that from a clinician's standpoint, we're not as interested in a, in a person's intellect as we are in their ability to function in the context of their environment. We're more interested not in is somebody different in some way, but how that difference affects their ability to exist and adapt in the context of their social world and their environment. That's what creates disorder. So severity for an intellectual disorder is now based not on their IQ score, but on their adaptive functioning, how well they are adapting in the world. So that kind of makes sense from a clinician's standpoint. So they also wanted to, uh, to modernize um, language. Now, keeping up with changes and shifts in the, the meaning that we attach to words and phrases is an effort to, to hit a moving target. Because, for example, when mental retardation was introduced into the DSM, it was a considered a politically correct, sort of more neutral term. Now, though, it has a very negative connotation. And so they changed it in the DSM-5, and they're going to constantly be changing language to fit with the times. Here we see um, a great example. In the original DSM, we had diagnostic labels like idiot, imbecile, and moron. Um, and so in that sense, maybe the Three Stooges were actually brilliant diagnosticians who were suggesting uh, diagnoses for their disorders to each other when they um, were actually making fun of each other. So these words like imbecile and moron and idiot, these obviously have a very strong pejorative connotation and they're very um, ugly terminology. And, and so they were removed from the DSM long ago. So what have they done with the DSM-5? Um, I mentioned that mental retardation has now been labeled intellectual disability. Hypochondriasis, uh, the term hypochondriac has over time become a more pejorative term, so they've now renamed it illness anxiety disorder. Stuttering has been replaced with childhood onset fluency disorder. And even little things like the Roman numerals in DSM, I mean, if we go back here and you look at the graphic here on the right-hand side, that tiny teeny little yellow sliver at the very top here, that's the DSM-1. It was very brief, very short, mostly psychodynamic descriptions of disorders. Then we got into our DSM-2 where we got bigger. The DSM-3 was huge because that's the point where we had a major paradigm shift. And we decided that we started, wanted to use a medical model. We used that medical model because prior to the DSM-3, there was so little reliability with diagnosis. You could have the same patient go before two psychiatrists in the same period of time and get very different diagnoses. And the word of the psychiatrist was like the word of God. And the psychiatrist, whatever the psychiatrist labeled was it. And it was an awfully subjective process prior to the DSM-3. But with the DSM-3, we said, no, no, no. People have to meet very specific diagnostic criteria for disorders, and we need to get m much more clear in what these labels mean. And so, sure enough, reliability increased with the DSM-3. And then the volume got bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the DSM-5. For the first time, we see an actually a, a, a somewhat slimmer uh, manual, although not dramatically so. But you'll also see on this graphic that we're no longer using Roman numerals. We're now using um, the Arabic numeral 5. And we're doing that for a few reasons, and one is that people are gradually losing their capacity to recognize Roman numerals for what they mean. And so it kind of modernizes things. But also what we expect in the future is instead of things like, you know, DSM-5R or DSM-5TR, 
we'll probably see DSM 5.1, DSM 5.2, and so on. At least that's the writing on the wall. And they intend to be uh, to be um, revising the DSM more frequently now than they used to. Okay, so what is next here? Um, somatoform disorders are now somatic symptom disorders. Pathological gambling, there's a pretty pejorative sounding term, is now gambling disorder. Gender identity disorders, now gender dysphoria. And phonological disorders, now the more descriptive speech sound disorders. So those are just some examples of the attempt to modernize language. So the next component of the DSM-5 paradigm shift is that they wanted to increase validity and reliability of diagnosis, which I think is always a good thing. I don't know about you, but valid and reliable sounds good compared to invalid and unreliable. So how did they do this? Lots of examples. They eliminated the GAF score. You know, let me tell you how I was trained on how to do a GAF score. And this is going to really influence, this is going to have a big effect on insurance and third-party payers. So remember what I'm telling you when we get to the frequently asked questions component. The global assessment of functioning scale. Um, my first job as a counselor, I didn't even have a bachelor's yet. I had an associate's degree. I almost had my bachelor's, and I got a waiver with the Department of Corrections to move into a counselor position prematurely from being a tech, um, and I didn't know what a GAF score was. I remember looking at my first psychosocial update template, and I got to the GAF score part, and I was like, uh, what is this? So I went to my clinical supervisor, and I said, how do I determine the GAF score? And my clinical supervisor said, oh, well, that's easy. This is what you do. You go back to their intake and to that portion of their chart, and you look at the number that somebody put on that. You want to make sure that the score you give them today is higher than that number, which suggests that they've been improving as they've been in residential treatment here. But don't let it get this high, and they gave me a range, because if you let it get that high, then the funders will say this person is functioning too well to stay in residential, they need to be discharged. And um, so to keep them here, we need to keep them in this range. That's obviously a very invalid um, uh, way of giving somebody a GAF score, completely outside of um, the designed purpose of the GAF score. What the APA discovered with time is that clinicians were misusing GAF scores. Not only were they misusing GAF scores, but they were actually, um, I mean, using them in very unethical ways. But in addition, there was very little reliability between two raters. One person gives a GAF score of 45, another person gives that same person a GAF score of 65 on the same day. It was so subjective and inaccurate. So they trashed it all together. It is gone. And, you know, a lot of people said, you know, it seems awfully dichotomous and pervasive and strange to try and give one number to try and quantify a person's entire functioning when people are functioning in so many different ways in different capacities and in different categories. Somebody can be very high functioning in one way and very low functioning in another way. And so how does one number really tell you something about that person? So you do not have a replacement for the GAF score, but they did suggest the use of the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule, the HUDAS, which I will show you how to access for free um, because you, it's a free tool available through the World, Orth, Organ, World Health Organization. And what I like about it in comparison to the GAF score is that it gives you different categories of functioning that you can put numbers on with very specific impairments in different categories of functioning. And the six-month duration um, for phobias required for the diagnosis of phobias has been extended to the, in, um, to the entire lifespan to minimize diagnosis of transient fears. I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. I think this is actually incorrectly worded, this bullet point. Um, in phobias, uh, for phobias specifically, they used to say, look, you know, you have to have the symptoms for at least six months um, in order to get the diagnosis. And they've expanded that to some other um, disorders, some other phobic disorders. If for substance use disorders, the diagnosis of substance abuse in the DSM-4 used to only require one criterion being met, just one symptom. That was it. 
and you'd have the diagnosis of substance abuse. But there's been some you know, some criticism and some dialogue about, well, look, if they only have one symptom, is that really a mental disorder? Or is it more like, okay, they're starting to have a problematic pattern of some kind to be aware of maybe they're at risk? So under the, in the DSM-5, you have to have a minimum of two symptoms in order to get the diagnosis. And that's in an effort to increase the validity of the diagnosis itself as a mental disorder. And so you'll see there are tons of other examples here. Um, I think another great one is they, there's a new specifier available in the DSM-5 with anxious distress. And that specifier can be tacked on to a depressive disorder or a bipolar disorder. Um, the reason they did this is because oftentimes clinicians would um, either diagnose somebody anxiety disorder NOS, or they would say generalized anxiety disorder, um, or maybe social anxiety disorder, even if the person didn't fully meet the diagnostic criteria, um, because they knew that the depressed person or the bipolar individual or individual with bipolar disorder also had some anxious distress that needed to be addressed. Well, you don't have to diagnose it as a standalone disorder. If they do not meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder, you could just tack on to the end of your depressive or bipolar diagnosis, comma, with anxious distress. And then we know that we can be providing in our treatment plan some measures that deal with anxiety, but we don't have to tack on another diagnosis. So you, you see how in some ways people can actually end up with fewer labels now with the DSM-5. Um, neuroscience findings have been implemented in the DSM-5. You'll see an example is that we used to have bipolar and depressive disorders would all be lumped into the same mood disorder category. That's no longer the case. In the DSM-5, you have a separate chapter for depressive disorders than you have for bipolar disorders. Because from a neuroscience perspective, bipolar disorder has more in common with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders than it does with people who have a unipolar depressive disorder. So it doesn't really make sense to keep them unified in the same chapter because on a biological level, they're so different, even though there were some convenience factors to having them in the same chapter before. Um, there are some other examples here that I won't go into, but you're welcome to look at them on your own time. For time purposes, I'm going to just kind of move along here to the next slide. Okay, so the last point I want to cover with the DSM-5 shift before we get more specifically into the third-party payer stuff is that the DSM-5 made attempts to accommodate the ICD-10. Now here's where things get a little confusing and, and so I'm going to try and explain it to you. First, I want to reveal the great myth of DSM codes. Technically, there is no such thing as a DSM code. I know that you see codes in your DSM I know you see numbers. In the DSM-4, you would have seen 305.00 alcohol abuse or 296.32 major depressive disorder, recurrent, um, moderate, and so forth. So you had numbers, but those numbers weren't created by the APA, and they weren't, they weren't created by the DSM task force. Those numbers are simply ICD-9 numbers in the DSM-4. What is the ICD? It's the International Classification of Diseases. It's a work under the World Health Organization, which is under the United Nations. It's an international classification system um, to create codes for disorders that would be universally recognized from one country to another. And so the DSM-4, which is predominantly an American um, publication, but also actually had a lot of representation from Canada and Australia and New Zealand and so forth, but um, the DSM just simply lists the ICD codes for your convenience. In the DSM-4, they listed ICD-9 codes. Well, here's the deal. The ICD-10 created a whole new um, number classification system. The new ICD-10 codes are alphanumeric. They're not numbers like the old generalized anxiety disorder you see on the screen here. The ICD-9 code was 300.02. The ICD-10 code is F41.1. Normally, in the ICD-10, if you see an F, that would denote what is probably considered a mental disorder. So 
in the United States, because each country gets to decide when they implement the ICD, changes in the ICD, we're behind the rest of the world. We're still using the ICD-9 code, and we will continue to use that code until October 1st, 2015. So when the DSM-5 was published, um, they knew, okay, no one's using ICD-10 yet here in the U.S., yet we won't have a DSM-6 before ICD-10 comes out, so what do we do? So what they decided to do was in the, in the DSM-5, you will see two numbers for each disorder. You'll see the old numeric code that we're used to, 300.02 in this case, and then you will see in parentheses the ICD-10 code, in this case F41.1, so you will be ready come October 1st, 2015, because the new ICD-10 codes are right there in the DSM-5, just like the old ICD-9 codes are. So remember, the DSM is separate from the ICD, it's just that the DSM for your convenience gives you ICD codes. Now, the Affordable Care Act um, will be, has in some ways some implications for us in terms of diagnosis. One of the big things that I want to throw out here is that there has been a fear, a traditional fear in diagnosis that's led to some unethical behaviors. Specifically, those unethical behaviors are upcoding and downcoding. For those of you who aren't familiar, upcoding means, okay, this person maybe has a more minor problem, but I'm going to diagnose them with a disorder that's more severe so that they can, so their insurance will cover it so that they can access counseling for, for less money because they can't afford treatment otherwise. Well, you may be able to make the argument that there's a very noble reason or cause for what you're doing. Um, but it is an unethical behavior. Um, it's called upcoding. It's, it's unethical. Um, your clinical judgment shouldn't be based on third-party payers. Your clinical judgment should be based on your clinical judgment, on you being an accurate diagnostician. The other ethical issue was downcoding. Downcoding, an example would be, let's say that you determine that somebody's disorder is borderline personality disorder, but uh-oh, insurance their insurance company doesn't pay for a personality disorder, so maybe I'll make it bipolar disorder instead. Um, well, again, you're being um, dishonest and, and inaccurate from a clinical perspective in an attempt to make sure the person can access treatment through their insurance. Well, the Affordable Care Act, um, or another reason that people would downcode is because they were afraid, look, if I diagnose this person with a personality disorder, or maybe a chronic disorder like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, then in the future, if they lose their job and they have to buy um, health care insurance, then the health care company could consider it a pre-existing condition and therefore not cover their mental health care. Well, that was a substantial fear that led to downcoding in some cases. But the Affordable Care Act um, makes it so that insurance companies can no longer refuse coverage or charge more for people who have pre-existing health conditions. That should hopefully result in a reduction in the unethical practice of downcoding. Um, so I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Okay, so now we're going to get into some very specific stuff, which is great because we are right on schedule. We're about halfway through today's presentation, which is half what's the paradigm shift and half what about how this relates to getting paid. Now before I go into this though, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that have popped up. We have a new question from Angela Harper. She is asking, are you going to email a hard copy of the presentation later? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, I'm not going to, and the reason why is that at the end of this presentation, I'm going to tell you exactly how you can download the hard copy from the internet for free. Um, but that being said, if you guys find it helpful, then maybe I will go ahead and uh, um, I can go ahead and, and attach it. Let's see here. Well, no, I'm, I'm not going to make any guarantees that I'll be able to get it out by email, but I will show you how you can access the presentation. Okay, so before we move on, do we have any questions on the paradigm shift, on the things that we've covered so far? I see a couple hands raised. One hand is um, Rise Page. So, Rise, I'm going to unmute you. If you have access to your microphone, you can go ahead and ask your question right now. Rise, going once, going twice. 
Okay, don't hear from you, so I'm gonna un or I'm gonna mute you again, and we're gonna move on to Darlene, uh, Dr. Silvernail, who has her hand raised. Oh, except I just accidentally unraised her hand. Let me see if I can bring it back here and unmute Darlene. There she is. Okay, Darlene, you are unmuted. Would you like to ask your question? I do not hear you. So I don't know if your microphone, maybe you do not have your microphone on. Okay, we'll go ahead and mute you now. Probably the best thing to do is just go ahead and type your question into um, the either the chat box or I think there's a box that says questions there. Um, here's a new one. Are you familiar with the book, The Quantum Doctor? It relates to the removal of dualism of mind and body. It's blowing up medical students in a great way. That's from Barbara um, Segura. Uh, no, I'm not aware of that book, but it sounds pretty cool. I'll have to check it out. Um, the Quantum Doctor. So you guys heard it from Barbara. Anyone else want to type a question in here? Here's a new one from Antoinette Hollis. Do you think the cultural formulation interview will become a requirement for clinicians since it appears to be evidence-based? Um, I doubt it. I strongly doubt it will for several reasons. And number one is it can be time-consuming time to um, implement the cultural formulation interview. And I don't think it's necessary to do a good job to use that tool. I think it's a great option to have. And I think that would be sort of maybe overstepping and, and um, getting too micromanagey with clinicians. Um, so I doubt that it will become a requirement. Um, I think more realistically, it'll be a great tool that clinicians will have the option of, of using. All right, so I don't see, oh, here's a new question. Um, from Barbara. The author, actually a comment, the author of that book, um, The Quantum Doctor, is Amit, A-M-I-T, last name is Goswami, G-O-S-W-A-M-I, a PhD physicist with a foreword by um, Deepak uh, Chopra, MD, so that's pretty cool. All right, I don't see any other questions for now, so I'm going to, oh, here's another one. Darlene uh, Mayers says the sound cuts out every two minutes. Just wondering if anyone else is having that problem. Um, is anyone else having a problem with the sound cutting out um, or are we good? No problem with sound. Several people are saying no problem. So um, yeah, that's probably just you, unfortunately, Darlene. Um, now my intention is to make a recording of this presentation available to you all. Um, so be on the lookout for an announcement about that. Um, I'm going to show you where you can, you, where you'll be able to find that recording once I make it available. Um, and so hopefully those of you who are having, if anyone else is having a sound problem, you'll be able to view this later and um, and make up for anything you might have missed. Okay, so back to the presentation. And let me just minimize this screen. Perfect. So. At this point, we're going to get into some of the specific nitty-gritty questions that deal with the DSM-5 and insurance and other third-party payers. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a couple polls here because I want to see what you guys think, what your opinion is right off the bat. The next poll that I'm going to launch is the question, now that there's no multi-axial -diag multi diagnostic system, no access 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, will insurance companies start paying for personality disorders and V codes. You will see that that poll has been launched on your screen and here are your options. The first option is of course. <laughs> and the second option is who knows. And the third option is probably not. So I'm curious um, which option you guys would like to go with. So far we have um, a little over half of you participating. And now we're up to 72 percent Go ahead and click on which of those three options you want to weigh in on. Of course, they'll start paying for personality disorders and V codes as option number one. Second option, who knows? I've got no clue. And the third option is probably not. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll with 84% of you having voted. And I'm going to display the results. Looks like the most popular response 
just barely, was who knows. But almost an equal number of you, 44%, said probably not. So we definitely have some pessimists in the room. And then 7% of you think that the insurance companies will very generously start paying for personality disorders and V-codes. So uh, let me tell you what my opinion is here. Um, oh, and I need to hide that poll now so it gets off your screen. Uh-oh. I've just messed up and took us way away from where we're supposed to be, so give me a second to get us back. You know, I seem to do this almost every time I present somehow I get back to the first slide. Okay, so my answer is I seriously doubt it. Um, the reason I doubt it is a few fold. Let's start with V codes. V codes aren't disorders. They're not mental disorders. They are stressors, psychosocial stressors, or other reasons that people might come and, and see a counselor um, that have nothing to do with pathology. They are circumstances that may be a focus of clinical attention. Remember, insurance isn't about um, dealing with people's stressors per se. Insurance is about treating disorders. Insurance is focused on pathology. A V-code is not a disorder, so it's not a pathology. It can be a circumstance that somebody's actually doing a wonderful job with and having no clinically significant impairment or distress attached to. An example is that you could have a V-code for phase of life problem, and that phase of life problem is, gee, you know, I graduated from high school and I'm starting college, but I'm, a, I'm not quite sure exactly which major I want to go with. I've got down to three options, um, but I'm having a hard time picking between the three. But I'm not really distressed over it. I'm, I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic about it. Well, that could be a reason that someone might see a counselor. They might, because the further you go back in the history of professional counseling, the more that we were focused on career and lifestyle guidance. It's a great reason to see a counselor but it's not the treatment of a mental disorder. So of course insurance companies aren't gonna pay for V-codes. Now EAPs, Employee Assistance Programs, that's a third party payer that will pay for V-codes, um, but not, um, not healthcare insurance. That's not the appropriate um, funder for, um, for V-code focus. But now go on to personality disorders. Now here's the thing. Unfortunately, the rationale that insurance companies give for not treating personality disorders is that personality disorders um, are supposedly not very treatable. And so it's just, you know, it's the person's personality and you can't really treat it. That's the, their traditional perspective. Frankly, they're wrong. I mean, there's plenty of new evidence, and I have a great link here from the American Psychological Association that weighs in on this issue. Um, but take borderline personality disorder, for example. Um, just despite popular belief, um, borderline personality disorder, people can go from meeting the diagnostic criteria to not in the course of a lifetime. In fact, a substantial number of, number of people with a BPD diagnosis in the second half of their lives will no longer meet the diagnostic threshold. Now, does that mean they don't have the borderline traits or features? That's not necessarily true. It's unlikely that those will go away, in fact, but um, or at least completely go away. But will they meet the threshold for the disorder? Um, will they experience substantial reductions in impairment or distress with time? Even without treatment, many times they do. But now you throw in something like dialectical behavior therapy, where there's research that a year of DBT can result in somebody having substantial improvements, and in some cases not even meeting the full diagnostic threshold anymore. I say the insurance companies are wrong, and they need to start treating personality disorders just like they would treat other mental disorders. But I, I more pessimistically do not envision them changing in the near future. Hopefully I'll be pleasantly surprised um, but we have no, we've got no indicators that they're going to, just because the DSM-5 came out and, and got rid of the multi-axial system, that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily start paying for things they used to not pay for. Now I do see, let me look at, um, there have been some new hands raised here. Um, looks like Rise's hand is raised. Oh, but it's, I just never unraised their hand from before, so let me get rid of that. Okay. So back to the presentation. 
Second question. Question number two, when should I start using DSM-5? So let me go back to our polls here, and I'm gonna launch that question as a poll to see what your opinion is. When should I start using DSM-5? Your options are number one, I should have started over a year ago, I'm behind. Your option number two is as soon as you're ready to use it. Option number three is October 1st, 2015. And finally, option number four is never. They'll have to pry my DSM-4TR out of my Kung Fu death grip. I'll give you guys a few moments to respond here, and so far we've got about half of you responding. When should I start using the DSM-5? Over a year ago, as soon as you're ready, October 1st, 2015, or never? All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll with 90% of you having voted. And let's share the results here. Looks like 25% of you, a quarter of you, said over a year ago. That was the second most popular option. Um, and that probably is because the DSM-5 was released in, I think, May 2013. 14% of you said, as soon as you're ready to use it. And then the most popular option, 61% of you said October 1st, 2015. And not surprisingly, no one's going to hold on to their DSM-4 with a Kung Fu death grip. So that's what you guys said. And let me tell you what my perspective is on this. My perspective is, as soon as you're ready with the qualifier that you should get ready now. And here's why I say that. Um, First of all, again, the DSM-5 has already been out for a while. It was released May 9th, May 19th, 2013. I am surprised that here we are, um, you know, two years later almost, and people still, agencies are still not using the DSM-5. Um, some agencies anyway, a lot of people aren't using it yet. I mean, it's two years. It's time to, time to get into gear here. But why am I not saying you should have already started using it, start using it right now necessarily, because you need to know what you're doing. Um, you need to know a little bit about DSM-5 before you start using it. And technically, you don't have to use the DSM at all, except maybe you do. Here's where things get complicated. Our first authority that we're gonna take a look at is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, the feds. And they basically said, I'm paraphrasing, they basically answered this question by saying, look, it doesn't really matter. What matters most is that you're using the current ICD codes. Use the ICD-9 codes until October 1st, 2015, but from that day forward, if you're a HIPAA regular provider, you are required, you are mandated to shift to ICD-10, effective that date. Well, how does the DSM relate to this? Again, the DSM-4 doesn't even include the ICD-10 codes, whereas the DSM-5 does. So a lot of people sort of use October 1st, 2015 as their date for when they want to transition. I guess that's fine. That's a defensible position. But you can use the DSM-5 now and keep using the ICD-9 codes, because remember, the DSM-5 lists the ICD-9 codes. Um, but here's where things start to get tricky. Even though I'm saying you don't necessarily have to use a DSM, the reality is that if you start looking at your contracts with your third-party payers, some of them are mandating you to use the most current edition of the DSM. So let's look at Aetna, for example. Now, um, I took this from the Aetna Behavioral Health Provider Manual, and I gave you a link. It was published in 2013, um, and it's the most recent a manual at least as of uh, a couple months ago when I last updated this presentation. And they said diagnoses submitted on claims must be current and consistent with the most recent DSM criteria, which implies, hey, you should have already transitioned to DSM-5. It's been out for almost two years, right? I mean, so it's the most recent criteria. Then look at... Um, Blue Cross, which in Florida is managed under New Directions Behavioral Health. You'll see under the section Guidelines for Treatment Record Documentation on page 46, the treatment record should 
record documents a DSM-5 or ICD-9 diagnosis for clinical impression within the first three visits. Now, a small DSM freak part of me dies every time I see DSM-V because, as I brought up to you guys earlier, it's now dsm dash the, the um, Arabic numeral five instead of the Roman numeral V. So that I always flinch when I see it, but um, that's the obsessive compulsive part of me anyway. But either way, they're, they're specifically saying, look, we want you to be using DSM-5 even though you're still using ICD-9. So if you're a Blue Cross provider, guess what you're required to do? Use DSM-5. And now, though, just to confuse you, there are other insurance companies that haven't yet said you have to transition, or at least they've not specifically said it. Look at Humana, which is managed primarily by LifeSync when it comes to behavioral health care. The most recent provider manual on LifeSync's website is from 2011, so it's obviously outdated, and it requires DSM-4 diagnoses. Managed Health Network, if any of you are on with them, the contract indicates the diagnosis must be consistent in the most recent edition of the DSM, just like Aetna said. Mental Health Associates, which is also MHNet and Coventry, their Medical Necessity Criteria Manual for 2014 specifically requires DSM-5. Value Options, their online authorization process whenever there's a pre-auth needed, which is rare, it forces the clinician to enter a DSM-5 diagnosis, not a DSM-4. And then look at, here's a government payer, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, for those of you who are vendors for that state agency providing therapy for their clients. Their counselor policy manual specifies that the most current edition of the DSM-5 should be used. Yet, confusingly, it also references a multi-axial diagnostic system, which is DSM-4, so they obviously need to update their counselor policy manual. So, I would have gone with the 14% of you that said as soon as you're ready, but I kind of also would go with the 61% of you who said October 1st, 2015. And I also agree with those of you who said over a year ago, because I believe you should have already learned this stuff. And if you haven't, I don't want to shame you for that, but I want to encourage you to learn more and use options like this webinar as resources. And you certainly need to use your ICD-10 codes effective October 1st. So I guess everyone wins with this question. You're all right. All right, so, but then people say, Aaron, what about these forms that we get from EAPs and insurance companies? Um, now, most of you are, especially if you're working on an outpatient level, you're not getting a whole lot of scrutiny probably from insurance companies with what you're doing. For me, an insurance company rarely questions something that I do. But, um, and, and for most of my clients, no pre-auth is required and there's no, they have unlimited sessions based on medical necessity for outpatient care. So again, very little scrutiny from insurance companies. But if you're a higher level of care that's more expensive, like IOP, PHP, inpatient or residential, or um, there are some exceptions like psych care, you gotta do an awful lot of documentation for them. Um, what's another one that often requires some kind of pre-authorization? Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but psych care is a great example. Um, so they have these forms, and the forms actually still have on them access one, access two, access three, access four, access five, GAF score. Um, so people are like, well, if I'm switching to DSM-5, what do I do with these forms? Well, let me tell you what I've been doing. Um, what I've been doing is putting a big fat line through those forms, and I've been writing in DSM-5 eliminated multi-axial diagnostic system. And so far, no one has kicked anything back to me, and everyone has paid me. Because you can't on one hand say, we want you to use the most current edition of the DSM, but on the other hand say, give me a multi-axial diagnostic um, diagnosis, because there is no longer a multi-axial diagnosis in the DSM-5. Now I do see here that we have a new question. So I'm gonna try and click on that. Questions. Um, nope, apparently the question went away or something because the only thing I see is comments that were good with sound. Okay, so let's get back to this. Now I have a nice little link here from the APA that says, you know, insurance companies, you might want to give them a little bit of time 
um, to to get their forms updated and everything. Similarly, agencies need to start updating their forms and getting rid of those multi-axial um, diagnoses. So next question, now that there's no GAF score, how will clinicians demonstrate level of functioning to insurance companies? Well, let me administer another poll here and see what you guys think. Here are your options. <clears throat> your first option is Use the WHODAS 2.0 instead of the GAF. That's the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule. Your second option is you'll use the DSM-5 specifiers, all those lovely options that you can tack on to the end of a diagnosis. Your third option, and so some of those will specify severity and things like that. Your third option is use a bunch of tests and measures. Insurance companies love numbers. And your fourth option is through a thorough and succinct through thorough and succinct documentation. So look, just beef up your documentation and make sure that your clinical notes demonstrate, you know, a person's level of functioning. And then your final option is your good old fashioned intuition. They will listen to you just because you are a licensed mental health counselor, right? <laughs> so those are your five options so far. 65% of you have voted. I'll give you just a moment longer for which of these five options. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, you can actually click on more than one. Um, if you decide that a few of these are accurate, you can click on several options. 81% of you have voted. I'll give you just a moment longer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close with 84% of you having participated and share the results. The most popular response, 35 or 73%, is DSM-5 specifiers. And then 35% said the WHODES, 27% said through thorough and succinct documentation, 12% of you said tests and measures, and 4% said, look, my good old-fashioned intuition, that's how I demonstrate to insurance companies how well the person is functioning. So let me give you what my answer was to this question. <clears throat> my answer is almost all of the above. At least I would select four of those five options. I would not have said your good old fashioned intuition because frankly, I don't think insurance companies care. That's subjective. They want facts, data. Um, because they're interested, that's kind of their idea. They're, they don't want to pay for it if it's not uh, medically necessary, right? And so you just saying it's medically necessary may not be sufficient. Now you may have a point, if you selected this option, I mean, on my EHR, my electronic health record, there's always a box I have to click on that says, you know, that this service is medically necessary. So that's just me using my good old fashioned intuition, I guess, but, but I think insurance companies are primarily interested in more objective measurements. So again, the WHODAS would be a great option if you want to demonstrate a person's level of functioning. Um, it's a way to quantify and show specifically how the person's disorder is interfering with their ability to function and adapt in the context of a society. But also there are a lot of great tests and screening instruments. I like to use the Symptom Checklist 90 revised in my practice. <clears throat> now it costs me money to use it. Um, if I do a handwritten um, administration, it's about two bucks per administration. And if I do a computerized report, it's about $5 and I get it through Pearson Clinical. But this is what I like about it. It basically lists 90 symptoms and then the patient um, selects on a scale from zero to four how much they were bothered by those symptoms in the past seven days. And then it scales um, how significant the person's symptoms are in comparison to the average gender appropriate norm for their age group. So, and it gives you multiple skills, depression, anxiety, phobic anxiety, interpersonal sensitivity, hostility, psychoticism, paranoid ideation, and then some global measures as well. So what I do is I give them this test usually at the end of the first appointment. It only takes them five to 15 minutes tops to complete it. And I use it as a baseline. And the second appointment, I review the results with them on a graph to show them where they're, where they're placing themselves and in position to the average um, person in their age group and their gender.
And then I tell them, fortunately, I'm accustomed to seeing these scores come down over time. And so we'll look for changes with time. And then once in a while, for some clients, it might be once a month. And for others, it might be once every six months. Um, I will re-administer it. And I'm showing the changes in their scores. I'm showing that they're making progress. But oftentimes, I'm also able to show that they're still clinically significant in some areas. And it's great feedback for the patient, too. They seem to get a kick out of seeing these scores change over time, in my opinion. But there are other um, sources you can use. Um, and I'm going to show you some other measures that are free that are available online through the DSM-5 website. Insurance companies love this stuff because it's normed and it quantifies and it's a little bit more objective. And yeah, you can criticize some of these measures if you like, but the bottom line is, I, is that insurance companies don't say no to me and they don't say no for a reason because I've done my homework and I can very objectively show, um, back up what I'm saying a person needs. And this is one way I do it is through some tests and measures that aren't tr dramatically complicated that I'll administer from time to time. Now, um, severity specifiers is another great example because again, with the DSM-5, you have all these new options. You can tack on how severe they are or what how they're functioning or um, what level of support they need depending on the diagnosis right there in your diagnostic label. And that's another way to demonstrate of where the person, how the person's functioning. And then again, your clinical documentation. If you ever get audited, your clinical documentation needs to show not just how wonderfully well the client is responding to your treatment intervention, but also what's not going well still. Where are the areas of deficit still apparent? Um, because you're constantly doing two things. Um, in a good case scenario, you're documenting number one, the patient is responding to treatment. They're improving in some ways. And number two, you're documenting they still have clinically significant problems, and that's why we're still providing treatment for them. And I give an example for substance use disorders. The ACM treatment criteria is another wonderful way that insurance companies really dig um, to be able to demonstrate um, the person's level of functioning. So there are all kinds of options that you can use, um, even though there's not a GAF score anymore. This is a very specific answer um, from, I think this is an APA article, um, with the removal of the multiaxial system in DSM-5, how will disability and functioning be assessed? And again, they kind of talk about the HUDAS as being a great, um, a, a great option to use. You can look at this later if you want. All right, so question number four, moving right along. <clears throat> Without the multiaxial system, what will a DSM-5 diagnosis look like on paper or on a typed report or whatever else? Well, believe it or not, I also have a poll for this question. Um, oh, you know, I, can, I see that I never took off the, uh, the screen from last time. Let me open up the new one here. Okay. Without the multi-axial diagnostic system, what will a DSM-5 diagnosis look like? You have three options that should be on your screen right now. Option number one is it's going to look like a big giant run on sentence with all kinds of labels in it. Option number two, it's going to look like a flow chart. Option number three is it'll pretty much look the same as a DSM-4. You just won't have specific axes listed. So it looks like 40% of you have participated, 60% uh, now. I'll give you a, just a moment longer to weigh in on which of those three options you want to select. What will a DSM-5 diagnosis look like? All right, with 74% <clears throat> of you having voted, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Actually, it looks like about 80% of you. And let me share the results here. No one said a flow chart. The most popular option, 71%, said pretty much the same as a DSM-4. And 29% of you said it's going to be a big, giant run-on sentence. So let's look at the way I answered this question. <clears throat> the way I answered it is I gave you a sample from Counseling Today magazine from an article that um, was published in August 2013 um, where they give a case scenario and then they give you how they, what they made the, the 
diagnosis look like? Now, you don't have to have bullet points necessarily, um, but really the only difference you see here is that you don't see axis one, two, three, four, and five in front of stuff. Well, there's a second difference, and the second difference is that you see things coming in different orders than they might look on the old multi-axial diagnostic process. So, for example, we have what used to be an axis one diagnosis, 300.4 which is now called persistent, persistent depressive disorder, but used to be dysthymia. But you'll see that there's actually a personality disorder above that, which used to be access to other specified personality disorder. So how do you decide which thing goes first? You decide based on what you as a clinician determine to be the area of focus for this intervention or the most clinically significant area of focus to begin with. If that's a V-code, you put the V-code first. But here's my disclaimer with that. Even though you now get to be a good clinician, you get to decide what's most important to you and the client and what your primary area of focus is and put that first no matter what it is. Keep in mind that insurance companies aren't going to pay if they don't see um, certain for, for certain things. They won't pay for a V-code probably. And sometimes they're not going to pay for a personality disorder. So if your code that you give them is a V code or a personality disorder, just don't expect to be paid. But if you, on an insurance billing form, if you use the 300.4 here, you're probably going to get paid. So keep that in mind. Now you'll see, uh, well, that answers another question in the future. So I'll skip the thing that I was just about to tell you. And we'll get to the next question. Question number six. Now that there's no multi-axial diagnostic system, will counselors actually be paid for counseling focused on a non-mental medical disorder like diabetes or obesity? Because again, you look back at that example I just gave you a moment ago, and let's see if I can show you this. You'll see that the counselor lists comor uh, let's see your uh, overweight or obesity. Well, traditionally, do counselors get paid for that? Um, but can we get paid for it now that in the DSM-5 we're, we're listing these me medical disorders and we're not putting it on a separate axis, an axis three? So let me launch a poll for this question and see what you guys think. Your options are, of course, why not get paid for it? Or, yeah, right, I wish. Those are your two options. So I'll give you a few moments to weigh in and decide, do you think that counselors are going to be paid for counseling focused on a non-mental medical disorder? So far, about 65% of you have weighed in. Give you a moment longer. All right, with 81% of you having voted, I'm going to close this poll. And I'm going to show you it on the screen here. 16% said, of course, why not? And 84% say, yeah, right, I wish. Um, well, I guess there's a little bit of a disclaimer here. The answer is different maybe if you're talking about EAP. Because, again, EAP will pay for V codes and things like that. And you may tack on a V code that's connected to the medical disorder like diabetes or, or obesity and be able to get paid for it. But... For the most part, I would agree with the 84% of you who say, yeah, right, I wish. And let me show you in greater detail my justification for that answer. First thing is that just because we are denoting, we're identifying medical disorders in our diagnosis, doesn't mean that we're qualified to treat those medical problems. We are. Most of you are licensed mental health counselors. Some of you are MFTs and some of you are CSWs and some of you are interns and some of you are students. But um, bottom line is that you're credentialed in the world, in the realm of mental disorders, mental health. So that doesn't mean that you can competently treat medical problems at their core. You're treating more some of the mental aspects that might be connected to some of these things. Um, but a second thing, that I want to that I want to um, add as a disclaimer. See, people have said, "Look, <clears throat> Aaron, 
is it really okay for me to give a medical diagnosis like obesity or diabetes or epilepsy when I'm not a medical doctor? Shouldn't I have no business adding that to my diagnosis? The answer is yes and no. You shouldn't be the one diagnosing that medical disorder because you're not qualified to do it. But what you should do is if you have documentation that they have been diagnosed with a medical disorder and that medical disorder is relevant to the counseling work that you're doing, you should list it in your diagnosis. Um, you're not the one who made the diagnosis, but you're going to be partially addressing it in your counseling work, then it should be on there because you should have a thorough diagnosis that includes um, mental disorders, that includes uh, v codes that includes medical disorders that are going to be um, factored in through the counseling process or addressed in some way through the counseling. And so, certainly, let's say you're treating somebody for binge eating disorder, it's relevant to add the obesity diagnosis if you have medical documentation that it's been appropriately doc uh, diagnosed. Now, for me, I very commonly have release forms signed to primary care physicians, psychiatrists, or other medical experts that are working with my clients. And so I get those diagnoses, and I often am therefore able to include it in my record or on my treatment plan or whatever else. But I'm not the one making the initial diagnosis. Or maybe the client brings in documentation of it. Or maybe you work in an, a residential program or an inpatient setting, and they've seen a medical doctor in your facility who's made the diagnosis, and now you're regurgitating that diagnosis as you do your own clinical work. You still want to list it. Okay, so now I want to come back to a point I brought up earlier. Which, is, um, which deals again with getting paid as you transition to DSM-5. Remember that insurance companies really like numbers, they like statistics, they like tests and measurements. So I mentioned the ACM treatment criteria earlier. The ACM treatment criteria, if you get good with using the six holistic, multidimensional um, categories, of function uh, of focus when it comes to assessment. You basically got six dimensions with the ACM treatment criteria. And from a counseling perspective, you know, we're trained to be holistic. We look at the whole person, not just the medical disorder diagnosis. And I love the ACM treatment criteria for that. They factor in the whole person when they decide what level of care somebody needs and whether they should stay at that level of care or be discharged. And insurance companies like the ACM treatment criteria because it increases objectivity. It creates a standard, a way of trying to, to objectively demonstrate what somebody needs and why they need it. I brought up the Symptoms Checklist 90 Revised that I use in my practice. And there are options like the Beck Depression Inventory and Beck Anxiety Inventory if you have a client with depression or anxiety. And then there is um, the WHODES. And I actually give you a link here, um, and I'm going to show you how you can access the WHODAS online in just a moment. Now, um, before I get into DSM-5 resources, I'm going to um, give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions here. First, I see that a hand has been raised by Glenda Bates. Glenda, I have... Um, enabled you to speak now. You are unmuted. So if you have your microphone and you're able to talk, you should now be able to do it. Let's see if I cannot hear you. Are you there? Glenda, you're talking to us. Nope, I don't hear you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you. And what I would ask you to do instead is type your question into the questions box. Let me open up that box and see if we have any new questions. Anybody want to ask something now? Oh, there are a bunch of, there are some new ones it looks like. Let me see here. Nope, those are all old. Let me do this. Here's a bunch of questions about... We answered that already. 
Okay, looks like really all these questions have been answered already. So, um, oh, here's one. Christine Hendy is asking, when including a diagnosis from another source, do you record that source? Um, I do not record it in my actual diagnosis section. So what you'll see is just like the sample I gave you a moment ago. That sample doesn't say something like, you know, as per so-and-so or whatever. But I actually do diagnose it. I do denote it personally because I use an electronic health record. My electronic health record is um, the uh, that I use as therapy notes. And in therapy notes, uh, when I'm uh, doing a progress note or I'm doing an initial um, intake or I'm doing a, pro, uh, a treatment plan, there's a box that says, you know, other information about assessment or evaluation or something like that. And I'll tend to put in there, you know, diagnosis of diabetes as per patient's primary care phys physician, Dr. John Norcross or whatever, and, and the date of that record. I do that just because I'm so thorough and sometimes obsessive compulsive with my documentation. Um, but do you have to do it? No, I don't think you have to as long as it, as long as you have that documentation available if in theory someone ever challenged you on it. But but I, I like to put it in the record myself. Um, another question from Glenda Bates. There is a belief in the field that the Beck depression and the Beck's depression and anxiety is considered not a strongly valid assessment tool. Can we obtain another source, another choice? Okay, um, so my answer to that is yes, I have seen criticisms for the Beck depression and anxiety inventories. Now, one of the criticisms, just very briefly, I'm, I'm grabbing something to pull up another resource for you guys, is that the Beck depression and anxiety inventories are are entirely contingent upon accurate self-report from the patient. So there are no validity or reliability scales or things like that. Um, but guess what? That's the way it is for almost all screening instruments and testing instruments for standard outpatient visits. If you're doing forensic work, you wouldn't want to use something like a, a Beck inventory as your primary source for that reason. You'd want to use tests that have a lot of validity and reliability scales and so forth. But throw that aside, I have read that the Beck Depression Inventory is is um, is actually pretty good for determining severity of depression, um, even though there have been some criticisms. The Beck Anxiety Inventory, frankly, I am unimpressed with personally. I think the verbiage is weird. My patients don't even understand what I mean with some of the symptoms that are listed on that inventory. I still have it available and I've used it, but not very often. So I wanna bring you back to the Symptom Checklist 90 Revised because that has both a depression and anxiety scale as well as a phobic anxiety scale. And it's a catch-all. The SCL, because it has multiple clinical scales, it's a great resource. So that's one. Now there's also the Hamilton rating scale for depression. That is more subjective and it puts more of the onus on the clinician to observe symptoms than on just patient self-report. And there's another tool that I'm about to show you online um, in just a moment. So I'll finish answering this question in a moment. Um, I also had gotten from it would take me too long to pull it up right now, but I was at a training on tests and measurements through the National Board of Forensic Evaluators, and the forensic evaluator gave us another great option in place of the depression inventory. Um, if we have time, I'll try to pull it up later, but it would take me a few minutes to fumble around and pull that information up. Okay, any other questions before I move on to showing you some of these resources online? Nope, not so far. Okay, so you're welcome to add a question later if you want to. Let me get back then to the screen though and give you some free stuff. So the first thing I wanna show you is on my website. My website is anorton.com, A-N-O-R-T-O-N.com. And if you go to that website and you click on resources, and then you click on, um, let's see which one it is, counselor resource page. 
So we've clicked on resources and then counselor resource page. And then the next thing you'd click on is DSM-5 resource page. So again, that process was anorton.com, click on resources, then counselor resources, and then lastly, DSM-5 resource page. Some of the things that you'll see here, um, you will see things like here's a video of a two-hour webinar I gave to FOMCA in November that goes through all of the changes with the DSM-5, everything that's new. It's like a more detailed version of the first half of today's webinar. And then you'll see a four-hour version I gave at USF um, in January 2014. Um, so that gives you a more in-depth look, and I co-present with Dr. Henry Tenenbaum for that one. But I will also give you a disclaimer. There are a few things from that presentation that are already outdated. For example, in that presentation, I told everybody, look, you know, you have to use ICD-10 October 1st, 2014. But since then, new legislation was passed that delayed further to October 1st, 2015. You will see some handouts from some previous presentations I gave, including full PowerPoint. This resource here, DSM-5 Implications for Insurance and Third-Party Payers, that is basically the PDF version of today's presentation. So if you want to know how to get the slides from today, this is the link you want to click on. anorton.com, Resources, Counseling Resources, DSM-5 Resource Page, and then DSM-5 Implications for Insurance and Third-Party Payers. You will see some other stuff I did, like some ASAM things. This is a free tool that I'm giving you that I created to help you implement the, the new DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorders. And I posted some YouTube videos of some other presenters who present on DSM-5 stuff. But I want to draw your attention right now to a particular resource, DSM-5 Online Assessment Measures. If you click on that link, this will take you to the APA's DSM-5 page. This is where you can get some other screening tools and other tests and measurements that are free. The first one is the level one cross-cutting symptom measures. Now, here's the principle behind this. The principle is, if you went to see your primary care physician and you have your annual exam, your primary care doc isn't going to be um, asking you questions about every possible disorder of the body. Your primary care doc is going to ask you a small number of questions and examine you physically in a small number of ways to screen for larger categories of disorders. If the primary care doc gets a hit on something, a positive response, then that will lead to follow-up questions and so forth. And then the rabbit trail continues down until we get to a more specific diagnosis or the need for a referral to a specialist. Well, a good mental health evaluation works the same way. You're not going to ask every question about every disorder under the sun. You're going to ask a small number of questions, and if you get a hit, you will lead the um, follow that rabbit trail until you get where you need to go. The level one symptom measure gives you that tool, that general tool to screen as a starting point. You could, as I do, um, give this to clients in their initial appointment along with their other intake paperwork, like their consent to treatment. Um, eventually, I want to have it so they can complete it online because I now have a, um, a, a patient portal for my clients. But if you go to it, you've got three versions of the level one measure. You've got the one for adults. You've got one for kids 6 to 17 where you're actually talking to the parent or guardian. And then your final one is for more adolescents, 11 to 17, who could probably accurately answer the questions themselves. So let's pick the adult one. If I click on it, it's going to give me a PDF um, version of the questionnaire. I'm going to click on that PDF so you can see it right now. Page one is a disclaimer page that you can pretty much disregard. <laughs> Page two is the only page that you will give the client. Um, and page three is your instructions as the examiner. So what this form does is it asks 20 
three questions in 12 or 13 categories to assess, to, to screen for the possibility of a disorder in one of those 13 categories. Questions one and two are about depression. If somebody says zero to both questions one and two, you have already ruled out a depressive disorder. You know that if they're accurately reporting, they do not have a depressive disorder if they select zero for both of those. But if they give you a one or higher for one of these, well, now you, need, you know that you need to check into depression. Category two in question three is about irritability. Um, category three is, uh, looks at bipolar disorder or mania as a possibility or hypomania. Category four is anxiety. Category five is somatic disorders. Six is suicidality. Seven is psychoticism. Eight is sleep disorders. Nine is neurocognitive disorders. 10 is obsessive compulsive. Um, 11 is uh, dissociative. 12 is um, personality disorders. They actually have two questions that if somebody says zero to both of these and they're being accurate, which is a big and, then you would be able to rule out a personality disorder. Um, and then the final section is about substance use disorders. They give you three questions to look at that possibility. Your instructions are page three and they tell you, look, if you get a response of this or higher for any of these 13 categories, then move on to level two to do a more thorough assessment in that area. So what's level two? Well, let's pretend that we got a hit for depression on level one. Well, then we could go to level two depression adult and click on that one. And it will give us a tool. This tool is called the promise. And it's a way to get a more specific picture of what symptoms of depression they might meet and how severe their depression may be. So it says in the past seven days, and it makes the patient scale um, how much they have experienced all eight of these depressive symptoms. And it, you actually get a, a T-score and you get interpretation for what those results mean on page three. So these are free tools that you can use that are made available to you by the wonderful folks at the APA who normally charge for things. So it's kind of cool that there's something free here that you can use and insurance companies will probably salivate over your use of these tools because they like numbers and measures and specific symptoms and, um, and those sorts of things that can be more normative in their nature. Let me go back to my website. Um, actually, let me not, let me go back and just show you a couple other things that you may find helpful since we have a few minutes here. Here's something, a DSM-5 Substance Use Disorder Assessment Tool. I created this so that you would um, be able to download it and implement the new DSM-5 criteria. It gives you the 11 symptoms. You record which substances they've experienced each symptom with and when they experienced it because if it's been because that'll help you decide if they're in remission or not. And then you go down here and it gives you severity and it gives you remission and it gives you the other specifiers. So there's a tool available for you and you're welcome to download it and use it in your practice if you'd like. Let me go back here to the slides though. All right. <clears throat> So another um, thing is that there are now apps available for the DSM-5. I find it extremely um, helpful. On my iPhone, for example, I have the DSM-5 Diagnostic Criteria app. I can very quickly and easily enter in a keyword or search for a disorder and, and view the diagnostic criteria. I have the same app on my iPad. They are the most expensive apps you will ever buy. They're like 65 bucks or something like that. Um, they're available on Droid devices as well. Um, and there is also an ebook version of the DSM-5 that you can buy through the APA, which I have on my iPad, but I just thought these are kind of cool tools. Um, if you're tech savvy, you can so quickly pull up information. It's, it's a pretty neat thing. 
So there's another free tool available for you. All right, so this is in just information about me. Um, I am on FOMCA's, uh, I'm the chair for FOMCA's Board of Education and um, president of SOMCA, and I'm an adjunct professor at USF. Normally, I'd introduce myself with the stuff so you kind of know who you're talking to, and I'm a mentor for the National Board of Forensic Evaluators. If you need to get a hold of me, though, because you have follow-up questions that we end up not, I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes to ask questions here, but because we actually have another 10 minutes left. But in the event that you don't have time to ask a question today, or you come up with a question later on about today's um, webinar, just send me an email. You can email me at meanorton.com right here. Or um, you can contact me through my website, anorton.com, by just clicking on contact. What I'm offering you is to answer your questions for free if you have follow-up questions about this webinar. Um, as a part of the service that FOMCA is providing you, um, this is a benefit for you as a member, these webinars that we do, and I'd love to see you get the most um, out of the experience. Now, on that note, just a couple quick housekeeping things. When you exit today's webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. If you want CEUs and you paid for those CEUs, um, then you will need to complete that survey in order to get CEUs. Now, I ask that all of you complete it, please, at a, as a courtesy to us and as a tool that we can use to find out what we can do to improve our webinars in the future and find out what kinds of topics you guys are interested in. It's also good feedback for me as a presenter, so I know some things that maybe I might want to change in future presentations. So please complete it even if you don't want CEUs, but understand that you will not get CEUs if you do not complete it. Now, let's say for some reason, that it doesn't pop up on your screen at the end of today's webinar, or you accidentally closed out of it or something like that. Don't worry, because in about an hour, you're gonna get an automated email um, that follows up with you, and it, says, it will say, by the way, if you haven't already completed this survey, here's a link to it, and you'll be able to go in and complete it. Um, now, my request is that you complete the survey within 48 hours, because, um, we're going to be in a couple of days actually going into CE Broker and entering in CEUs, and I don't want to have to go back and redo it all later on because somebody sends in a survey late. So please do um, get them to us. Normally, uh, we would collect, we would just use what immediately is given to us at the end of a webinar, but I'll give you guys 48 hours in case you're really busy. So now, let's go to questions and answers. Anybody got any questions that they haven't answered yet that they would like to take advantage of the uh, um, eight minutes or so that we have left today and see if we can answer something for you. I don't see, um, oh, there's a comment in the chat box I thought I'd let you guys know about. The comment is coming from probably um, from, uh, um, from Michael, Michael Holler. And uh, he said, Florida Healthy Kids United Behavioral Health requires pre-authorization. So just so you guys are aware of that. I see some new questions, so let me get to those. Um, looks like we have, um, do you use the structured clinical interview for DSM disorders? Um, I, and that question comes from Antoinette Hollis. And my answer is no, I don't. Um, I'm just not familiar or trained with that tool, but I'm very curious now and would love to learn more about it, so I'm going to write it down. Structured clinical interview for DSM disorders. And my what I would be curious about is if that tool has been updated um, with, for DSM-5 or if it's running off of DSM-4 still. The next uh, thing is a comment from Dr. Silvernail, excellent job. And then she says, um, we call it the biopsychosocial. Okay, so that, are you saying that's what you call the structured clinical interview for DSM disorders? You call that the biopsychosocial? Or are you talking about something else? I'm not sure. Um, Antoinette just chimed in. Oh, Dr. Silvernail, Sil Silvernail just said yes. That's what she meant. And Antoinette said the clinical version 
and it is expected that this version will be published sometime in the spring of 2015. So hopefully the new clinical version of that um, structured clinical interview for DSM disorders um, that implements DSM-5 will be coming out very shortly here. Um, Antoinette said that it is an assessment tool. Christine says, thank you, this has been very helpful. Antoinette just gave us a website, www.scid, the number four, dot work. SCID4.org is a, the website to look into that assessment tool. All right, any other questions? This is your last chance, although you can always email me later if you have more questions. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. My intention is to take today's recording and to have it available on my YouTube channel. Where you will see it is on my DSM-5 resource page. So. Um, it'll probably be there in the next 24 hours or so. Again, how do you get to that? You go to um, anorton.com, click on resources, then counselor resources, then DSM-5 resource page. Um, I'm very dedicated to mental health counselors increasing our skills as diagnosticians and diagnosing accurately so we're not over pathologizing and we're not um, upcoding and downcoding. And frankly, we're getting paid because you guys do hard work and you deserve to get paid for it. I want you to not have insurance claim denials and, um, and I want you to get paid for the good work that you're doing. Um, and so it's and so I'm very passionate about this topic. And if you need other information from me down the road, please don't hesitate to contact me. It has been a pleasure meeting with you all today. Um, please do check out our next webinar option. In two months, we have an awesome presenter, Scott Miller, who will be presenting on EEG biofeedback treatment for PTSD. That should be an awesome presentation. We're going to be very fortunate to have him presenting um, live v from California, actually. And uh, that's in July. For more information, you can go to flmhca.org. Um, or on my website, on that counselor resource page, you'll see there that I have a link to view the whole webinar series. Um, and you'll also get email announcements if you're on FOMCA's email list. So I will hopefully see you in, in future webinars. It's been a pleasure today, and I wish you well. Goodbye.